first 91 is when I started in Spence Price. I was a financial controller for the linen division, as it was those days. Uh, Spence Bryson was started in the 1860s or 1870s by Spence and Bryson. And right up until 1989, they were a private company run by the family. And they had done extraordinarily well. But at the end of the 80s, sort of the textile business started to take a downturn. And um, I think it's fair to say they struggled. And then a big group called Richards PLC, a public limited company in Aberdeen, bought them out mostly for their um, carpet business. Because Richards were all carpets. And Spence Bryson at that stage had, they had carpets, they had spinning, they had shirts, they had the handkerchiefs and in the linen division. And in the linen they had a weaving factory and the bleach and dye works. I was based at the bleach and dye works in Donnacloney and I was responsible for the linen division and for the handkerchiefs. I was a shirt company as well. Up until Richards took over they were based in in the centre of Belfast, in Great Victoria Street, in a huge big building that's still there. It was bombed after the war and rebuilt. Um, they had Bangor was carpets, Newton Arge was spinning, Donna Cloney was the bleach and dye works, and Porter Down was the um, shirts and handkerchiefs. Each company different, differed, but there was, it was a, a large number. The handkerchief and shirts were predominantly female because they were all stitchers. Carpet factory would have been sort of more male. The spinning was probably slightly more male, but I'm guessing there. But no, there was a, there was a large number of women. Like there was 150 women, I think, just stitching handkerchiefs when I started. No, I was based in Donnacloney while the linen company existed. That was in 1991. Now, I can't remember whether it was 91 or 92 in October. The the linen factory. Or that they actually wove the linen was blown up by a bomb um, in Market Hill. It was in Market Hill. Sorry, I forgot to mention that one. It was Market Hill. It was right beside the police station, and they blew up the police station and demolished our factory. Completely demolished it. And October was the peak production for linen because a lot of our fabrics went to Italy for the fashion industry. And it was we we had we were in sort of twenty-four hour shifts at that stage and we had, I think the week before the bomb would reach the highest production ever for the factory. And then it just was gone. Well, the, the building, the roof collapsed uh, on, the, on the building. Uh, it was a lot of water damage obviously with firemen putting fire out. We got a, a, an industrial site about four miles away um, and we, once we were allowed to go in, we removed as much machinery as we could and relocated it and we actually had the factory up and running again in three weeks which was like a minor miracle <laughs> but unfortunately the damage was done we missed all the deliveries for that autumn you know because all the work in progress was all ruined all the stuff ready to ship was all ruined for the fire and the and the and the water so we're basically starting from scratch and it's quite a long process by the time you get the, the, um, the threads in and, and get them set up to weave the, 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 the yarn and then put them on to the machines to actually weave the fabric. Then the fabric has to be finished, has to go off to the finishing works to get bleached and dyed or whatever. So it's quite a long lead time. So we basically, so it was the next year, um, basically the, the group decided to sell it and we sold it to another company in Northern Ireland that also did linen and they took it under and were allowed to keep using the name Spence Bryce and Linens, which has caused quite a confusion over the years because <laughs> everybody thinks they belong to us but they don't. Um, so that whole site was closed. The, the, the bleach and dye works was closed. The weaving shed was sold to this other company and, and then I moved across to Porter Down to the handkerchiefs. It was one of those twists of fate. The, the chap who was the accountant in the shirt company died the week before I was due to move over. So um, I then became accountant for the shirt company as well. That was in 92, 93, probably 93, 94. So then I was, account I was the, the finance director for um, the shirts and handkerchiefs. Now at that stage they still had the carpet business and the weaving business. Uh, but again, the, the tribulations of the world of um, carpets 
the group was struggling and uh, basically one by one they closed the carpet factory, they closed the, um, the, uh, the spinning, spinning place and it was just literally the shirts and us, the handkerchiefs left. And I always remember the very first day I joined, the, the, the managing director came over and said, you're in charge of the handkerchiefs and shirts, he says, but they really don't fit with this company and as soon as we can get rid of them, we'll get rid of them. And I said, no, that's very kind of you. <laughs> you just started a new job and you were told you could try to sell them. Um, but they were the two that ended. And the handkerchiefs was the one particularly I wanted rid of. I, I, in 95, I was made managing director of the hankies. And it was my decision then to buy the, the competitor. And was literally just doing my job. My job there was to make handkerchiefs, regardless of what they thought of the handkerchiefs. My uh, my job was to make it a success. And um, they had a very. I used to go across to board meetings in Aberdeen, and there was all these. There were seven other managing directors there, and they were all to do with carpets, and they'd all have to do their half-hour presentation. And at the very end, little Norman would come along, and every one of them was losing money, and little Norman was making money. And I always remember the chairman, he's a lovely, lovely old man, he's probably in his 70s then. And I was sitting on his right one day, and he was just sat and he says, now, and he puts his hand across and pats my knee, he says, and now we'll hear from Norman, the only one that makes money. And he just sitting there, this 70 old man sitting pat my knee, I'm thinking, what is this? It's very bizarre. But he's a lovely, lovely old man. But yes, we, were, we made money, and, and uh, most of the group at that stage was on his knees. And then I say the, the close of 2002. Oh yes, oh, that's a very important part. Everybody knows handkerchiefs and Spence Bryson go as a sentence. And it was essential. You know, any professional bar you buy in, the, in, in, in any of the big store groups, you know, say to you, where do you get hankies? Oh, Spence Bryson's. And we're the only major, we're the only sole handkerchief company left, I think, in Northern Ireland. In fact, in, fact, in U the UK, it's fine. We're the only company that just does handkerchiefs. I think whenever I bought the company there was about 120 staff because we're still doing an awful lot of folding. The handkerchiefs were mostly at that stage made in China. We still made all our linen, which in fact we still do make all our linen here. And we did an awful lot, we probably had about 25 girls just folding handkerchiefs to put them into boxes because we still did an awful, probably more actually, it's probably about 40. And we still embroidered, we still stitched the linen handkerchiefs here, we cut the cloth here. so we. Um, What's the word? Circumvented the system by shipping them to Taiwan and got him to box them and then ship them from Taiwan to here. Folding, it, it, it might sound and simple, but actually rolling a handkerchief to put it into a box is actually quite a skilled job. And we would probably take about two months to train a girl to get to a level where she is producing enough to make it cost effective. If the, the girl that we had, we had one girl in particular who was, she was all arms when she was rolling. The arms were flying and every single visitor factory just stopped and went, opened their mouths. They couldn't believe how fast this girl was going, but she'd been doing it for 25 years and she was extremely good at it. In the older days of the business, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were looking at the sort of third generation. You know, the first generation started in the 1880s and then their sons came in and then grandsons. Um, the oldest employee I had that left was 88. And she very reluctantly, when she was 80, went down to three days a week. I don't want to go down to three days a week. What am I going to do? And at 88, I had to say, look, I'm sorry, but, you know, we just don't have the work for you anymore. But at 88, I just thought, I think you've done your bit. Yeah, and again, it's, it's unfair to keep something like that if you're having to let because we at that st all those years we were reducing staff, reducing staff. But again, she she was in a way I had to keep her because she had this, um, a stitching skill. She was a stitcher, and again, it's one of the skills that has just disappeared. At one stage, we had to make I think we were making thirty redundancies in the factory, and we offered every single person the chance to retrain as a stitcher. Not one single person took it. Not one. It's not. It's not a life sitting at a stitching machine, it's quite stressful. You might think it's easy because the machine does it all, but you have to have the right tensions, you have to work at the pace of the machine, you can't force it, you can't go slow, and you have a quota to do every day. But not one single person took it, so we ended up having to close our stitching operation because we just didn't have, couldn't get stuff. We use subcontractors, or we get more made in China, we just get more made in China. It's the same as hand rolling. Hand rolling is another skill. Again, I think the last lady that we had to do it lived in Donegal. 
and I think she was 90 and she was still hand rolling handkerchiefs. That's where you, you take a piece of cloth and you actually roll it so that the loose threads are covered and then you hand stitch it. Like I said, absolutely hideous job. <laughs> My teeth would be good. Now, now I know there are still people stitch. A lot of the, our, our companies I know still have stitchers. It's harder and harder. Like no, no young person wants to come out and be a stitcher. We have embroidery technicians that use the embroidery machines, and even general factory work. I think that there's, a, there's an aversion now by the younger generation to work in factories. You know, it's all about Tesco's and Next's and shops like that. They all prefer it. They see it, perceive it as an easier life. No different from any other job. There was, you, had to do, you had to do your job and do it well. You, you were disciplined if you did it wrong. Or just the normal things. There's nothing more difficult about it than any other industry. Like if you were in an electronics business, you have to know what you're doing. If you're in manufacturing cigarettes or manufacturing widgets for bottles, you have to know what you're doing. It's the same thing the tax industry. It is much more manual, it's less automated. Like the saw machines that we were using must be 100 years old because nobody, I had every major singing singer brother in to try and get a modern machine and none of them could do it. One of them said, oh yeah, we can develop that for you, it'll cost you about 50,000 pounds. There are different, you have to have different heads to do different hems. Um, even in the Far East now, there's, there's one particular hem we just can't get done anymore. A, a, a one inch where you, you double it over and then stitch it so it forms like a, like a double edge, like a, you know, like a sheet has. Uh, and we have to, have to stop doing that handkerchief because we just can't get it done in India or China. Well, yeah, again, it's spare parts, like we have a container, sorry, had a container out the back which probably had like 60 old sewing machines in it and we just had to strip them because you just can't get spare parts for a, a 1902 Singer. <laughs> and yes, again, the, even the technicians, as you say, we've gone through about five in the last ten years. Mm -hmm. They're few and far between. Because mm -hmm. again, a lot of machines don't get fixed now. Mm -hmm. The importing from the Far East, that's the biggest, biggest change. Like I say, at one stage we had 300 people working handkerchiefs and now there's seven of us. It's sad in a way, um, because we're not offering the same employment levels we had before. But in another way, it makes our life, my life, a lot easier. Because you only have seven people to worry about instead of... 300 and uh, all especially the unionization and stuff it's it takes up a big chunk of your life it takes it away from just actually worrying about making the business happen whereas now I would, I'd say they're all everybody here is very long-term employee I think there's one girl I think she started when she was 14 she's now in her late 50s my number two Christopher he's been here since university he's 40s now so, you know, this, the, I think the youngest member of staff has been with us like nine years. We are mostly a distribution centre. We still, um, so the, we would get containers in from China. Obviously all the administration is done here, all the design work's done here. <coughs> we have to design checks, colours, ladies' embroideries, that sort of thing. I put a brochure together, that's all done. Then we place the orders from China, manage it in, get the containers, unload the containers and then it's just a matter of shipping out the orders. The other bits that we do here now, we still have an embroidery machine because like one of our big customers decided they wanted a funny little embroidery and they wanted 2,000 boxes for Christmas and they decided, what, three weeks ago? So there's just no way we could get it done in China. So we still have an embroidery girl has done those and then we've still got, uh, we had out workers. We, sorry, I forgot to mention out workers. At one stage we had 60 out workers. So they were ladies who worked in their own home and we sent the work out to them. They folded it into boxes and sent it back. I think it was 60 at our height. That was probably in the mid 90s, early, early to mid 90s, 93, 94, 95, 96. Again, I think uh, one, one, of our, one of my staff's mother, and she, I think she was 92 and she was still on handkerchiefs. But now we've got two. So, you know, so there, that's another change. Like we, and that's a, a significant level of employment for people who wouldn't have gone out to work because they had kids or whatever. The, the handkerchief business is very much about Christmas, so we would do probably 70% of our business in September, October, November. But you're preparing, like I'm starting now, this is November, I have next year's ranges almost put to bed uh, for the designs that we're going to be selling Christmas. Customers, in the old days, 
we would have gone out and seen customers in January, February. You'd have had all their orders by April, May at the very latest, and then you start shipping in September. It just doesn't work that way anymore, except for the big, big groups. But um, so the first three or four months of the year was quieter because you were just preparing and doing samples and sort of you know you were working to normal. But then in September it just went mad, and we were overtime and. Get, trying to get as many hours out of the girls as we could. 95% would be to the UK. Uh, and we do the linen, the linen which is, is all Irish linen, and still called Irish linen. It would go to Japan, Italy and the States. They're the three big overseas markets for, for the linen. Probably the dad bought the company. And being able to go in and tell, because every other member of the group had been made redundant, except for our little company, because I was in negotiations with the receiver. I think probably going in and being able to say, it was actually, I can remember it as well, there was a whole lot of problems and it was, it was five to five on Thursday before Good Friday. And I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting all day. And I told the staff, we'll know today. And at five to five, they rang to say, well done, you've got it. And the girls were all putting their coats on and I said, Oh everybody come back in and told them so I think that, that was that was nice. So they could all go away knowing for Easter that they had, because those days would close for two weeks at Easter. So they all could go away for the holidays knowing that they, they still had a job.